All right, I believe that we are live. Hello, Reworld Clinicians. This is Ali Nese. It's a great pleasure to be here with you over the next hour and share with you some of my experiences and some of my techniques and uh, ideas about endodontics, an area I'm very passionate about. Over the next hour, we're going to be talking about this stuff. Uh, the title of my presentation, and let me go here to the screen already, is... Uh, we will then those uh, real world by ceramic based techniques and technology. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I've been asked to present to this group uh, on a live presentation. I wish I was there in person so I could see you, but I guess we'll have to, given the situation, uh, suffice to deal with the uh, uh, technology so I can reach you. My understanding is we have a large number of dentists from. Uh, the uh, Australia, New Zealand, as well as some that is from Europe joining us today live in this presentation. And I look forward to talk to you about uh, this area. I'm a clinical endodontist. I consider myself a, um, you know, an educator, but primarily still a clinical endodontist. I've been now practicing for nearly 30 years. And uh, uh, as an endodontist, I've now completed over 26,000 clinical cases that are documented, and uh, I also teach about a day and a half a week at the postdoc program at the Harvard Dental School, where I've been teaching for the past 25 years, 26 years actually, actually 27. But anyway, so um, today I will be talking a little bit about some of this bioceramic based technology. I'd like to first acknowledge uh, you guys for attending and spending your next hour with me. And in terms of disclosures, I have helped develop many of the techniques and technology that I'm going to talk to you about. So to that extent, these are some of, of these materials and techniques are my babies. So, but I want you to keep in mind that I'm still a clinical endodontist and I've been practicing in downtown Boston now for all these years. So I'm delivering these techniques and these techniques are a byproduct of my clinical experience that I'm sharing with you. So uh, given that, I come to you right now sitting in Boston, uh, right across the uh, other side here in Boston Common. I took this uh, picture a little bit earlier on. We have the summer in full bloom here in Boston. And uh, what you see is the window right outside the window. I, I'm in this high-rise building here overlooking the Boston Common, which is the oldest uh, park in the United States. Boston being such a historical city. Uh, I live on the 12th and the uh, 11th floor of this building. And here on the 8th floor, I have this little studio where I do these presentations, which I've been doing now during the COVID uh, for, um, um, to all of the residency programs in the country and have just been active here online, not as much in person. And I've seen the seasons pass here over the past year, just looking out the window, moving from the New England fall with its beautiful foliage uh, right here on the Boston Common. That, by the way, is the State House, uh, as you see on the, on the right side all the way to uh, then uh, the, field, the, the, the leaves falling off in the winter, and as is usually customary in the New England area, this usually leads to a fairly cold climate here up in New England with snow and blizzards and all kinds of crazy conditions in the wintertime. But thankfully, this all comes to an end, and as you saw, we've now moved on to the spring and now to the summer where we are. So. Weather-wise, we're doing well. I know some of you in the Southern Hemisphere are, in, you know, enjoying your winter right now. Uh, I hope all is well wherever you are. Today, as a part of the agenda, um, you know, we're going to focus on obturation and the obturation materials. So I want to talk to you about that, some of the new and modern uh, techniques and technologies available to help expedite and facilitate uh, the obturation process. It's obviously important to all of us who know anything about endodontics that the endodontic triad of cleaning, shaping, and obturation is really not an equilateral triangle. The emphasis should primarily be based on cleaning and disinfection or and removal, biomechanical instrumentation, and so on. Uh, since shaping and obturation are secondary, uh, obturation is still the way we get our cases judged postoperatively. So people still like to look at a radiograph and say things look good or bad based on what they see. So that's why the emphasis is. However, I want to constantly remind you about the importance of cleaning and shaping so we don't get focused on trying to create shapes on the radiographs, but think in terms of the concepts of what we're trying to achieve, which is to eradicate and remove the important biofilm, which is the source of endodontic disease from inside the root canal. And then we want to fill and obturate that canal so that 
any remaining potential bacteria can now regrow in there post-operatively. To that extent, I always show this image and this slide and share it with my audience because I'm a big believer of this quote that everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler. And uh, this essentially says it's very easy to take something simple and make it complicated by trying to uh, you know, just kind of recreate and make things uh, uh, harder than they are. The, the real genius is in trying to take something complicated and making it simple. And for us, that point of irreducible complexity clinically is achieving clinical success. And clinical success isn't some type of a process-based outcome. It isn't going through step A, B, C, D, E, F, and then, you know, expecting success. Uh, because at the end of the day, we need to think of concepts. You know, we don't want to follow recipes. We want to understand concepts so that we can then triage and change the way we need to deal with problems based on what we're facing. Uh, it's not a disease-based outcome either because disease-based outcome in endodontic at least is focused on the radiographs. We should not be focusing on the radiographs. We should be kind of, again, going back to understanding the concepts. And in a sense, the endodontic success for us as clinicians and as pro probably private practice owners and operators, it's really a patient-based outcome. And that's something I don't have to tell you. I'm sure every single one of you practicing out there understands that ultimately, besides all of the bells and whistles and all the things that we use and, and uh, love to use as, as, you know, as tools people, it's essentially about the patient. I don't want us to forget that because that's what I talk about to all our residents on a daily basis about the importance of creating uh, patients that remember the peak and the valley of their experience in, under our care and then they will leave and become our raving fans. That's really important because when it comes to tools, there's certainly no paucity of tools in endodontics and in all of dentistry, but these tools should really be used as a as some type of a uh, method by which we can improve our efficiency because the real efficacy of care, the increase in success comes really from the understanding of the foundations. So today, with the use of all of this bells and whistles and all the technology, we can achieve a more efficient process of achieving our goals and leading to the same results. But the essence of concepts of eradicating the bacteria and, and mechanical uh, shaping and disinfection is still the foundational understanding of what we're trying to achieve that we should not forget. But when it comes to innovations, clearly we've seen a lot of innovations over the past 30 years. I've been lucky enough that I started my career in endodontics right at the brink, at the beginning of all of the innovation that kind of came into endodontics. And the first one was the operating microscope. So luckily I managed to learn how to do endo with the scope from the beginning as it is really two different procedures based on the magnification illumination you see, you really are far better able to, um, to look at the dental mac map and then you know manage the things that you see, especially for surgery and things like that. The scope is really important. It's also helpful to your posture. Another more recent innovation has been the addition of CBCT technology to our repertoire. CBCTs have been an incredibly helpful tool, and in my opinion, they have really improved the success rate of endodontics. And you may say, well, what is the evidence for that? The, all I can tell you is we know for sure that, that CBCTs help us achieve better diagnosis by seeing better deep in, into the bone and into the tooth. And furthermore, be able to also find out about the anatomy in advance, what we're dealing with, where are the canals, how they're joining, and so on. So having this kind of knowledge will help us have better diagnosis, uh, triaging between apicoectomies versus retreatments. That's an important thing that we didn't have before. We had to get inside the tooth before we could sort things out. Now we know that if a case is failing, is it because of a hidden canal that was untreated, in which case we want to do revision, versus a, an, you know, a ledge at the end of the route where all the canals have been treated successfully, in which case surgery would be better, uh, a better option in those cases. So indirectly by allowing us to do better diagnosis and better treatment planning, CBCT technology has helped us improve our success rate. And the other things are the modern hand pieces with all of the fancy motions that help us be more both efficient and safer during instrumentation and their combination with apex locators, electronic apex locators that help us 
get this motion synced up with the apex locator so we don't really do uh, any accidental perforations of the apex. They allow us to stay inside the tooth. So in a sense, they could help us reduce post-op pain this way and with the motions help us have a safer instrumentation technique. The advent of, of ultrasonic technology has been incredibly helpful, especially to my practice because I use ultrasonics very, very uh, um, routinely in all of my cases, almost 100% of the cases, non-surgical retreatment as well as surgical cases for various combinations. They are very versatile and I think it's a must on the bench of every endodontic operator to have an ultrasonic, a piezoelectric ultrasonic that is connected to water using wet tips, not dry tips, to constantly agitate and remove macro debris removal. And of course, night tire instruments have been incredibly helpful. I was lucky when I started my uh, program back in 93. And so uh, that was when night tire instruments were first invented. So our program director uh, over there at Harvard when I was attending the program had the foresight of being the first program to incorporate night tire rotary instruments into our clinics. So I ended up doing any hardly any hand instrumentation and getting straight up using the NITI rotary instruments with the first generation of files. So now the 26,000, you know, six, 700 cases that I have completed on the record have all been done with this evolution of the beginning of NITI files to the later uh, generations. And I've seen how these things have really evolved with different designs and metallurgy, different motions and method of understanding of how things work. And they've really helped expedite the process of doing endodontic therapy. But, and last but not least, is the recent innovations in the past 13 years or so with the use of some of these nanoparticulate bioceramics. Of course, the first bioceramic that was on the market, as we'll talk about in a second, was MTA. That was really back in 1993 when it first came out. But um, the more recent nanoparticular bioceramics, speaking of the endosequence bioceramic line, for example, that came out in, in uh, 2008, uh, this really has really helped expedite the obturation process as well as its use as universal cements, which we're going to talk about. So here in this presentation, I want to talk to you about some of the biological and bioactive endodontic cements, particularly these bioceramics. And to sum things up, bioceramics are essentially a um, form of ceramics. Ceramics are these amorphous crystalline structures that are um, resistant to heat and corrosion. And, you know, obviously all our ceramics, we know the pottery and all that stuff are, 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 are ceramics. Bioceramics are a subset of these compounds that are ceramics that have biological uh, activity or there are bioinert. So bioinertness in these bioceramics that are the subset of these ceramics is essentially those compounds that have no biological activity. They are inert. Bioactive bioceramics are those brand of bioceramics that exert a positive uh, biological response in the form of bioactivity, uh, you know, um, and so on. And, and they kind of induce bone formation. They're very, they can allow home, homing of the, uh, of uh, some of our stem cells and so on to the area. They allow regeneration and they expedite regeneration through a mechanisms at cellular level. Um, so those are the bioactives. And this series of bioceramics have uh, now found their applications in endodontics all the way from non-surgical use to surgical use as sealer, pulp capping, apexogenesis, apexification and perforation repair, all the way to apicoectomy, resorption repair and per surgical perforation repair. So as you can see here, what we have is we have universal usage of these bioceramics and bioceramic compounds that has really revolutionized our field over the past 12, 13 years. Um, and that's, we're gonna a little bit talk about. Ah, basically, since there's so many applications, I'm going to emphasize primarily on obturation, but also mention vital pulp therapy usage as well as perforation repair. And at the end, maybe quickly go over some surgical root end filling. Uh, these are techniques that I have helped develop with this first generation of pre-mixed nanoparticulate bioceramics, including the endosequence BC sealer. 
So let's talk about the obturation first and foremost. And when we can't talk about obturation without talking about the person who really made obturation vogue, which is Dr. Herb Shelder at Boston University, locally right here in Boston. We have three dental schools within a five square mile of each other here in, the, in Boston. It's a mecca of endodontics. We have a big presence at, at Harvard, obviously, at, at uh, BU, Boston University, and at Tufts University. A great endodontist have graduated from here. And uh, Dr. Shelder was the first person who kind of came out and told all of us that warm vertical condensation is really the only way to get three-dimensional obturation. And what he meant by that is that to really try to fill in all of the dimensions of the root canal. And the question that I came up with me when I first learned about this as a dental student, well, was that, well, what is it that is sealing the root canal? And I thought that people were using sealer. Isn't sealer what's sealing the root canal? Well, my question then was, if that's the sealer that's sealing the root canal, why is it that we're all these, using all these techniques with fitting spreaders and pluggers to the apical five millimeter of a root, removing all of this additional dentin so that we can pack gutta percha. I thought the sealer is what's sealing the canal, so what is the point of all this packing of the gutta percha? When I started my endo program, I came to realize that the reason for this, all of this activity is the fact that the sealers that are on the market, based on Dr. Grossman's 1988 uh, study and follow-up, uh, on his work were all inadequate. And at that time, the sealers that were primarily available on the market were the zinc oxide eugenol-based sealers, the ROTS and the Kerr uh, root canal sealers, as well as the epoxy and, and resin sealers that were on the market. And all of these had certain limitations. So Dr. Grossman went on to uh, develop these properties of an ideal sealer, or describe them rather, as being dimensionally stable, biocompatible, bonding to dentin and gutta percha, antimicrobial, flowable, radiopaque, retreatable, and hydrophilic. And he found that all the sealers on the market were missing the majority of these properties so that the ideal sealer was not out there yet. So as a result of these limitations of sealers, we had developed this uh, idea of minimizing the sealer interface by really squeezing the gutta percha in order to thin out the sealer interface because the sealers were tireable and we couldn't rely on them to seal. We preferred to have gutta percha rather than sealer in those areas because gutta percha was um, more, uh, if you will, it was not as resorbable as those sealers were. But uh, the problem here, so as you can see here in the original single cone technique that was being used back in the 1950s and 60s, you had a thin piece of gutta percha and a sea of zinc oxide eugenol sealer, and that would invariably shrink and wash out, causing single cone technique to fail in its traditional sense with zinc oxide eugenol based cements. And so these, um, Innovators such as Dr. Shelder, as well as Dr. Wine, Ellison, and people who came up with these con condensation techniques, through heat and through actual lateral cold compaction, the idea was that you minimize the sealer in the canal walls. Of course, you always still ended up with a layer of sealer on the walls, which not only would shrink, but I would also wash out over time since these sealers were resorbable. As you can see here in this case that was done by one of our past graduates here at, uh, at Harvard, who's now a, a very uh, a great endodontist practicing in uh, Beverly Hills, Dr. Sherman Golian, uh, shared this case with me where he had done a root canal on this premolar, as you can see, and put the post in there immediately using warm vertical compaction with zinc oxide eugenol based uh, cement and you can see that the case looks beautiful at the time that it's done and uh, he had the patient back a year later and you can see looking at the apex here you have all of these fireworks that's a typical warm vertical compaction case but when we had the patient back for a follow-up a year later he looks at the same x-ray and realizes that all of those fireworks that we had are gone so it kind of makes us understand that when you have resorbable cements like this, what you're actually doing is you're just achieving a seal in the short run. And that is not really the goal of what we're trying to do. Because when cements are resorbable, when you create a puff outside the root, then that's not like the magically stop resorbing when it comes to the interface in, bet in between the catapercha and the cement. They actually do resorb at higher magnification. You will see in time past the apex into the canal as well. So this is the issue that occurs as a result of, um, you know, these cements, these resin-based cements and zinc oxide eugenol-based cements that are uh, 
resorbable. So um, as you can see, this is a case that one of my, our other uh, graduates who at our school and an endodontist in San Francisco, Dr. Nader Rafai, shared with me of a couple of cases he had done using both a resin-based sealer, I think he used the H+, and a uh, zinc oxide eugenol-based sealer, a ZOE-based sealer. So you can see the case he had done back in 2005 looked beautifully filled to the apex, and of the same tooth, in 2014, he takes an x-ray, he sees that the uh, cement at the end of the root is actually washed all out, and now there are lesions there six years later. So another case with AH plus a epoxy resin cement that he had done shows you have all of these broccoli formation, beautiful apical fill, warm vertical, but that's all resin sealer in there. And in 2013, he takes an X-ray of the same tooth. You can see that all of the material is washed out from inside the tooth. That's not the goal. That's not what we want to have because if you have parts of biofilm that have stayed in the tooth originally, and uh, then you it can potentially get reactivated if you form spores in there, as well as the fact that once you lose the sealer base, then you can end up having a higher rate of coronal leakage. So when people show you these nice vertical compaction cases with all of this fireworks at the apex, what we're dealing with is a moment in time, and things look great right then and there, but if the sealer is not a, um, a non resorbable sealer, then what's going to happen is you're going to have uh, this stuff resorb out in time. So, all of these issues with the sealers had to be addressed through compaction, uh, thermoplasticizing the gutta percha, or mechanically compacting it until the rise of bioceramics. And the first bioceramic, as I mentioned, those are you know, calcium silicate phosphate, uh, carbonate, these are all subsets of ceramics that have biological activities. The first bioceramic, of course, was MTA, uh, and that was a um, large particle size um, bioceramic, and, um, um, which was basically a trioxide. But, and then later on, a, a formulation based on, inspired by MTA, which was still a dicalcium and tricalcium silicate based material, was developed, but this was a nanoparticulate version of it that was premixed, and that was the endosequence biceramic line of products. And then shortly thereafter, biodentine was a calcium silicate, calcium carbonate based uh, biceramic as well. So these three MTA, endosequence BC line of products, and biodentine are the three main bioceramics that are pure bioceramics for which there is adequate research backing and, and time has passed to kind of for them to prove their, their merits clinically in use. MTA's limitations, despite the fact that it's the one with the most research, is first of all that it's limited to its use for you know, surgical applications. It's, the particle size is still too large. It's a water powder mix and it's the clinical handling of this material is not so easy because it turns into mud. But more importantly, because of the presence of bismuth oxide uh, and um, other agents that can oxidize, including even in the white MTA, you will get discoloration when you use MTA in dentin. So it's not uh, used in the anterior area or else you're going to end up getting discoloration, which is a problem. And the second negative uh, consequence of MTA is the fact that it's difficult with clinical handling to place the product. Uh, the BC line of products, which is a sealer, RRM, and a putty, are formulations of the same base chemistry with different consistencies that allow you to manipulate this biceramic in a pre-mixed fashion and place it for different levels of consistency that you want. Now, the BC Putty was my contribution to the line. When originally I ran into this product line and, and uh, helped develop it, there was, we only had the sealer and the RRM. I worked with the uh, original inventor of the product to uh, develop the putty for the specific clinical technique that I had been using, which is a lit technique, which I wanted to have a bioceramic version of. So the putty was developed in order to use the lit technique and the rest is history because now it is one of the most versatile and most commonly used uh, bioceramics um, internationally. Biodentine, another very uh, great product. It does not cause staining like MTA, so it's great. The downside of biodentine is just the fact that you need to triturate it and uh, um, it's um, um, 
the handling uh, properties of it is a little bit uh, different. And the, the, the BioRoot RCS version of it, which is for the sealer, also it's a powder and water liquid so, um, formulation, so it requires mixing. So ultimately though, all of these three materials create, an, uh, create a hydroxyapatite surface that is very biocompatible and allows the cells to hone in and grow over them. So all of these three products, you're gonna end up having cementum grow right over these uh, materials because the surface turns into hydroxyapatite after it sets and it works uh, beautifully as a result of that. The, the, these products go through a hydration reaction in which the water molecule works with the calcium silicon and releases calcium hydroxide, which will then work with uh, calcium uh, phosphate in the case of the end of sequence materials and then the calcium carbide in the case of the biodentine material and it results into the precipitation of uh, water and the uh, hydroxyapatite. And hydroxyapatite is the final set product of these materials and part of the reason why these uh, cements are so biocompatible. So uh, as a result of these chemical properties of these products, these materials will have biocompatibility, high biocompatibility, antimicrobial activity because of the calcium hydroxide and the pH of 12.8. These things can are antimicrobial in the case of the BC sealer. The pH remains high for about a week, so you can have antimicrobial activity for quite a while afterwards. It's dimensionally stable by ceramics actually expand ever so slightly. Uh, very, very little, 0.2% in the case of the uh, uh, BC line of products. And in fact, studies that I've done at the University of Pennsylvania where the material is used at the postgraduate and undergraduate level, and it's used also in our, at our school at Harvard in the postdoc in the, post the pre-doctoral level universally for all its applications, it, it shows that the seal improves uh, in 60 days following placement because of the crystallization and the precipitation of the hydroxyapatite, kind of like how amalgam's seal improves over time. These materials, actually, their seal improve over time as well, but much quicker uh, within 60 days. They're non-absorbable. They're hydrophilic, which is really important because we're working inside human beings that are 75% water. And dentin itself, people often say, well, in the case of these pre-mixed materials, what if the dentin is uh, completely dry? Don't forget, even dry dentin inside the tooth is still 24% water by weight. And that's an important understanding. So these materials inside the tooth, as long as the tooth is inside the body, they are hydrated and it will um, catch the water vapors and it will set. Hydroxyapatite bonding is another key thing because bonded obturation provides not only strength for the tooth, but also improves your coronal leakage. Clinical handling in the case of the premixed materials is also much easier. So, we know that these three products, MTA and the BC and the sequence BC line of products and Biodentine are the three proven ones. But nowadays we have a number of uh, other companies that are getting into the game because they are interested in the reality that most of the clinicians are now switching from the older generation of cements that are that have all kinds of biocompatibility issues and problems into the new bioceramics. So it's super important that you guys be aware that many of these products, they consider themselves or call themselves bioceramics, but they contain a number of non-bioceramic products. In the case of some of these, they contain resin, and uh, there's actually, they're primarily resin, but they have a little bit of bioceramic in there so that they can call themselves a bioceramics. You need to do your research to find out what's specifically in them, because some of these products actually even contain materials that are um, that are that potentially could be toxic and uh, create some organ toxicity, such as aluminum. So aluminum has been found in a number of uh, um, situations in in terms of causing neurotoxicity, accumulation in the brain and in the plaque of Alzheimer's, in in the liver accumulation and the kidneys. So it's an important thing. The placement of aluminum inside the tooth for in the long run would be one of those things that many people that are more health conscious would be avoiding. I personally, myself, since the 1980s when the articles came out about the problems with aluminum and Alzheimer's have not been using even deodorants that have aluminum in them. If you look, a lot of the deodorants actually have aluminum in them as well. So this is an important thing and I want all clinicians who are interested in getting any of these other products that may be more available to you in your market 
to take a look and read the material safety data sheet of these products to make sure that the product's constituents are pure bioceramics, some type of a, uh, a material that does not have any of these alumina and other uh, products that are potentially okay to use in the short term, but you don't want to leave them inside the tooth or, uh, forever uh, for a patient. So just keep that in mind. I wanted to kind of make you aware of some of these issues because this market is not regulated right now. Anybody can come in and put a bioceramic line or name on their product marketing as long as they put a little bit of bioceramic in there, and that's up to you guys to find out what's in it. So the more established brands, such as the MTA Biodentine and the Endosequence PC line of products that you see here on the page, the Nata particular ones have the most research, and a lot of this stuff has now come around. When I originally started using these products back in 2008, there was not a whole lot of research, but my background in bone biology and also in... Uh, uh, in biochemistry, which was my major in college, allowed me to kind of understand what the chemistry of this product was, and I knew that this would work best for this particular application in endodontics, which is part of the reason I embraced it before the research came out, but then the research kind of proved that everything that I had thought was actually uh, going to happen has happened, and as you see now, everybody else is kind of moving in that direction as well. So the Almeda et al. in 2016 is a nice little review meta-analysis of some of the research on this um, bioceramic line of products. There is a number of other ones. In fact, I have created and compiled a large list that you can find at our website at realworldendo.com. All you have to do is to go into the search field and put down science, and you'll get this one a video to which there is an attachment, which is this attachment that's a compiled list of uh, articles on bioceramics. You can also uh, go to our YouTube channel at Real World Endo uh, on YouTube and uh, you'll find a similar thing. Although for that, you have to go to the website to download the, this article. But not to go through over the hundred and, you know, of, of about 190 articles that have now been published on bioceramics, 92% of them are on the endosequence BC line of products. So it's a highly researched and now well-established product line. And uh, the vast majority of these are now what's resulting into the reality that they have made these products the, um, the most... Um, popular type of products being used now in this uh, domain of bioceramics. For example, one of the recent articles from University of Pennsylvania on the effect of the BC line of products on eight-week matured Enterococcus faecalis biofilm showed a very interesting finding that at two weeks and at, 20, at 24 hours and at two weeks, the uh, um, the endosequence BC sealer exhibited significant antimicrobial capacity in the presence of dentin for up to two weeks on an eight-week-old Enterococcus faecalis biofilm in comparison with AH plus sealer. And that is a significant and very important thing because it's the E. faecalis biofilm that is oftentimes associated in cases where there is a primary endodontic failure because this is a very, very resistant bug. And there's several artic articles and this one at Penn, there's other ones with the Capasalo that shows this bioceramics are, um, that can kill the efecalis almost immediately upon contact. So that's a very significant one, and I think it's important to kind of understand that it did much better than H+. Also, based on biocompatibility results, this material is about four or five times more biocompatible than uh, H+. And as a result, you'll end up having a little bit less post-op sensitivity in your patients. That's one of the main things that you notice off the bat. Uh, after using the bioceramics if you've been using resins in the past. The idea then becomes in this concept that we've developed at Rewaldendo called synchronicity, which is the idea that you mill a shape with a constant taper preparation and then everything else follows that shape. And now we have this gutta percha cone that is coated with the bioceramics, silent with bioceramic particles. So then the only thing that remains is how do we fill the gap between the gutta percha and the canal wall, and hence this concept of hydraulic condensation. Now, we call this hydraulic condensation instead of the single cone. The single cone is a derogatory term that has been pushed around by the big companies that do not have bioceramics to kind of push the idea of using warm vertical condensation, essentially. 
Hydraulic condensation is called hydraulic condensation because hydraulic cements are these bioceramics. And essentially, this is a cement-based obturation. The gutta purchase role here is not to act as a filler as it does in the case of warm vertical condensation and lateral condensation. We try to minimize the sealer interface. You don't need to minimize the sealer interface in these cases. You are essentially using your gutta percha cone almost as though you're doing a post preparation and you're cementing a post and your uh, cement is what's creating the seal for you. Uh, your sealer is creating the, the seal for you because it's a bioceramic sealer, it's a stable sealer. So you're cementing the cone to place and then you're melting it off a little bit above the orifice and immediately plugging it down with a large plugger so you get like a little nail head that kind of seals the area. And that's how it works and the idea is simple. A bioceramic, this more recent version of the endosequence BC uh, sealer is the uh, uh, high flow, which is more radiopaque and it's a little bit smaller particle size, so it kind of flows a little bit better. And with the bioceramic coated cones, you end up getting that kind of a monoblock. But the idea that I want you guys to all understand is that instead of using a spreader and a plugger to all the way into the final five millimeter of the case, your gutta percha cone is your condenser in a sense, and your sealer is your filler. The sealer is the equivalent of what melted gutta percha is in the case of warm vertical condensation. Now, the, the gutta percha really is doing three main things because you can fill the whole canal with a bioceramic otherwise. But the gutta percha's role is to first allow your length measurement because it's very difficult otherwise to kind of get your gutta sealer to the end of the root and fill it all the way up. It, it allows you to hydraulically kind of condense and push the sealer laterally adequately so you can put a little lateral force on the cones and on the cement which is because of the fact that it's uh, hydrophilic, it flows a lot better than other cements. And last but not least is the gutta percha acts as a path for revision or retreatment if it's needed down the line. And that's really the only way you can use this cement in a responsible manner. And when we ran into this cement back in 2007 and 8 and we were developing a technique for it, uh, we at Rivaldendo wanted to make sure that there's a responsible technique that allows people to re do these cases down the line, and that's now been shown. So hydraulic condensation essentially is the idea that if you have a small canal, you create a round shape, so the cone is only gonna fit in the middle and there's very little thin uh, interface left that's cemented with the seal of the bioceramic. If you have a little bit of a more oval canal, you're gonna have a thicker interface of the bioceramic, which is still not a problem, but having that main gutta percha cone in the middle still allows you to do your revisions you don't want to seal the whole canal with the bioceramic because while it does give you a monoblock and it will work if you can do it effectively, it's difficult to do properly and then it also renders the root canal uh, not retreatable, which is not a good idea. Uh, so you don't recommend doing a full cement fill using the bioceramic. To just go over the technique, essentially what you're doing is you are creating your shape, and now that shape is matched with the matching silenated gutta percha cone, a BC uh, cone, and the, these new minimal waste tips allow you to uh, inject a sealer. The goal is to only inject in the coronal half here, you can see it's in the coronal two-thirds, and then push the sealer to the apex with a file. You can use a hand file, you could use a rotary file uh, in reverse, and then I take a coated cone and slowly work it out. The key here is to not have such tight cone fit that prevents any backflow of the cement. You need to have the sealer back up from the, uh, from the side of the cone, so you need to have a little bit of room. And as you can see here, <clears throat> if you have a very funnel-shaped uh, uh, coronal area, you, need, you can add additional cones on the side so you can get a denser look. That's part of the reason why this is not a single cone technique. If you have an oval-shaped root, add additional cones. This hydraulic condensation is essentially based on the idea of using cement-based technology. All right, so let's talk about a clinical case here. This is a case of actually a dermatologist, the head of the dermatology department here at Harvard Medical School, and unfortunately ended up needing a uh, root canal on this maxillary first molar that has a crown, and as you can see, um, he was having symptoms in there of irreversible pulpitis and pain, and we go in there and I take a routine CBCT now in all uh, my cases, especially the molar cases, and during the routine CBCT, we find that here on the paddle root, as you look in this axial section, that there is a resorptive defect, it's an internal resorption defect that is present that you can see and uh, right on the paddle root. So the paddle root is showing this resorptive defect, 
And uh, luckily from the CT, it shows that we don't have a perforation yet, uh, but obviously we want to do, we want to get started. You can see that on the regular x-ray and the, on the PA, you do not see it. So from that, we also saw that there is an MB2, but it joins the MB1 halfway down the canal from the uh, thing we can see. And you can see here on my axis preparation, I can see the MB1 and MB2 and the fissure that connects them. So I go on, do my crown down technique using the lit technique, and you can see that I do a lot of irrigation, ultrasonics throughout the way. I work my way down through this series of crown down, going from a size 40 down to a size 20, uh, and uh, enlarging the canals. And at the end here, because of this fact that I do have that oval, or rather this, this area of resorption on the paddle, I'm just using a 3D instrument here. This is the XP 3D uh, shaper, or rather finisher, to just clean a little bit better that potential tissue that could be in there that my round files couldn't have um, touched. So now I am going into the uh, shaping. Everything was shaped with this uh, blend technique to a size 40 or 4 in the sequence BC cones that are seated and. Uh, a radiograph shows that we're filled to the end of the route where I want to fill. I'm using this new irrigation uh, device that I haven't uh, yet, it's not launched yet, it's, uh, and it's a negative pressure, positive pressure kind of a technique. And now the canals are dry, you can use paper points to dry them, you don't need to desiccate them like you would with the resin cements. And then I'm injecting the sealer only in the coronal half again. So after you have done, you can see here, I take an extra, this is just a demo I wanted to show and to see what's filled. And you can see that we just by injecting the sealer, we filled the whole resorptive defect already. So I go here and I'm also using a 3D instrument to just coat the canal walls. And you can see that it coats the canal walls nicely that way. This is again, this guy was being a dermatologist and a physician. He just was super curious. So I, I took images from the steps that I normally don't take to just kind of show him uh, what we were doing and explaining it to him. So I, as you can see, I place each cone uh, one at a time, cement a little bit above the orifice and go back immediately when I have two canals that join, I do them at the same time. I go a little bit above the orifice, go quickly with a size 10 plugger at the beginning and spread the gutta percha while it's still molten so that by the time I use the ultrasonic and water to clean the rema remaining cement from inside the canal, you can see that it's easy to clean it. I only can see the gutta percha and there's no sealer seams showing. So here I'm using the BC liner, which is an optimized uh, resin ionomer that has been uh, designed to work with the bioceramic liner products and work with all of the uh, bioceramics. Uh, it may not be available in your line of, uh, in your area. In that case, you may want to just use a glass ionomer instead. And uh, this is now used to kind of seal the axis as well. This is called the BC liner. And this is the final x-ray. You can see we have a little puff of the cement and that's not a problem, it's inconsequential. And you can see that we filled the inside of the canal. And that's just with hydraulic condensation. We did not do vertical condensation. And you can see that we do have our little puffs and we have a fairly good void-free um, preparation and obturation in these cases. So we take a post-op um, image as well a uh, few weeks later. And you can see that things are doing very well. The patient's asymptomatic and we're, the, the fill looks very good. And... There is no perforation. This kind of proves that. And uh, you can see that we denude the 3D image and that's what we have. We have the MB1, MB2 joining and that's the parallel route that has those little um, areas of resorptive defect. All right, so that's that. And I have obviously now I have completed over 11,000 cases with this bioceramic material. It's been my unique and exclusive technique since 2008. And um, I, I have seen easily many 12-year recalls and so on on these patients using this material. So, uh, you know, you can see that these, this back in 2008, so I was a hygienist of one of my referring dentists. You can see that we filled this and in 2008 and moving fast forward to 2018, you can see that the cement is still there at the apex is filled while the bone has come back in and the cement is stable, the tooth was doing well. And to also show you that the material, the bonding that you get is really serious here. You can see that in this case, this was a tooth that I just put the cone in there after injecting the sealer, but I didn't uh, burn off the gutta percha. I left it 
and I put it in a water uh, glass so that it would set. So then later I tried to pull it out to see if it just comes out. This was like a week later I picked it up to see if it would come out. And it didn't. As you can see, it bonded in there. It just broke off, even though I just pulled it out, uh, tried to pull it out while at the orifice showing the bond. So this bonding has several advantages, including the fact that based on several studies now around different universities, and that's another key thing is that you want to make sure that the products and the, the, the research that you're seeing have been done at universities based on unbiased and uh, non-commercial uh, sources. And this, these, all of these studies are showing that improved resistance and fracture. Uh, and that's something that we've seen in the past with when we move from amalgams to composites, the idea that bonding helps us be able to be also more minimally invasive. So that if you had to create a shape to remove the bio biofilm and that you were done, then you still had to remove a bunch of dentin only so you could put your pluggers at the apical uh, five millimeter of the root, you were removing extra dentin so that you could facilitate your obturation. And now, because obturation has become simpler as a result of this technique, you don't have to remove that dentin so you could be a little bit more minimally invasive in your preparation. I still think, though, you need to have a good apical diameter, but your tapers no longer have to be those excessive tapers that we saw with thermoplastic techniques that required uh, a lot of funneling up on top so that the uh, sealer, oh, so, th so that the thermoplastic gutta percha would not slough off of your carriers. And people who use carriers really uh, like this technique because of the fact that it allows you to do these types of uh, more minimally invasive preparations. Let me skip this one, actually. Um, so one of the questions that always comes up is, well, what about extrusion? Will that be a problem? The key with the extrusions is the reality that the cement itself is very biocompatible. If you took a spoonful of this material and put it under the rabbit's skin, you will get minimal amount of inflammation. But oftentimes, when if you see a patient that has a big uh, puff and the patient has pain, what you assume is it's because of the puff that the patient has pain. However, I will submit to you that the reason for the pain is not what you see on the radiograph, but what you don't see on the radiograph. And what that is, is that oftentimes if there is a big puff, this means that we probably have violated the apical constriction. We have over-instrumented. As a result, we probably have pushed a lot of biofilm out during instrumentation. And we have also probably pushed some hypochlorite out during the irrigation. So the pain that you may see postoperatively is related to uh, the stuff that you don't see on the radiograph. And that's a key thing because you can have really huge uh, overfills with this material and the patient has absolutely no pain as long as it's not because of uh, over-instrumentation in a necrotic case. And even in necrotic cases, if you just get a puff as, you, as I did in this particular case, which is related to just hydraulics rather than over-instrumentation, no post-op pain, and a year later you can see that the bone heals completely and the cement is kind of there. So it just shows that uh, the question of uh, overfills is related more about the mechanisms of overfill than in the material, because the material is very biocompatible. What's nice about bonding also is, as it can show you in this case of a young patient that I did this second molar on, I told him to go have his wisdom tooth extracted and put a crown on his tooth, but came back two years later and asked me, well, what was it that I was supposed to do forgetting what I had said? is the fact that in this particular case, as you can see, there is significant coronal decay. The tooth is obviously not salvageable because the patient failed to restore the tooth. But if you look at the immediate post-op, you see that the apical lesion has healed and the coronal lesion, uh, so that, that kind of tells us that this hydraulic condensation here has, and the bonding is allowing for a fairly good coronal seal so that even in the case of significant coronal leakage, it's still doing pretty well. Now, what's interesting to know is then, as a result of these properties of these ideal sealer having changed, we've moved from the original and the old generation of sealers for which we had to do minimal sealer interface um, by doing all of those comp fancy compensation and condensation techniques to these new bioceramics that have all this dimensional stability, biocompatibility, bond to dentin and gutta percha, antimicrobial, properties, flowable, radio-opaque, and hydrophilic. Now, retreatment is, if you fill the whole canal with them, is not going to be possible, but that's why we develop hydraulic condensation that allows you to have gutta-percha as a center mass 
that is easily retreatable with conventional chloroform as there are now many studies that have come out showing that retreatability of hydraulic condensation cases, still some of these refer to these techniques as a single cone. Again, I don't want to get rid of the term single cone because it's associated with the failed original single cone with a sea of, uh, uh, bias, a sea of, 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 of resin sealer or a sea of uh, zinc oxide eugenol sealer in a thin gutta, gutta percha cone into a shape where you have a lot of gutta percha cone and an interface of a cement that is actually a filler. It's not even a sealer. So it's hydraulic condensation. And another reason for it is because if you have a very thin canal, by the time you finish the shape, you only have room for one cone. But if you have a very thick canal and a very oval canal, by the time you're done, there will be room on the sides. By all means, you can add additional cones. So hydraulic condensation is not a single cone. It could be two cone, it could be three cone. If it's a very wide canal, you could even sometimes put four cones in there. But now, because you have larger tapers, you don't really need to have as, as uh, many um, cones inside the tube. Now, even if you still want, you still have the option of using warm techniques with the newer version of the BC sealer, which is a BC sealer high flow. It's a little bit more heat resistant. It's also, incidentally, more radio opaque, so the cases will look a little bit better. And um, what that has been shown to, to do is that based on many of these studies are now showing, comparing root canal filling quality of mandibular molars with endosequence, BC, and AH plus sealers, a micro CT study by, this is the a Reutzen Blit uh, et al. study in 2019, showing that based on these molars that they studied, there was no significant difference between groups for filling volume, voids, and gaps using these two filling methods of warm con condensation uh, and uh, or, uh, or hydraulic condensation. So that's a key thing to keep in mind. Here's another one by Mc uh, Michael et al. in 2015, uh, essentially showing that uh, whether you were using continuous wave of condensation, or again, they call it single cone, but I call it hydraulic condensation, produce similar tubular penetration at both one millimeter and five millimeter level with the tricassium silicate sealer, BC sealer, and so on. So the technique did not quite matter. And as did I did this little study, and uh, you know, cold, a regular hydraulic condensation is a cold technique, but I figure for those people who want, there's a warm hydraulic condensation that you can do, which involves the idea of you basically fit your cone and then you pre-fit your plugger and your plugger can only go four or five millimeter into the tooth because you really don't need to get four or five millimeter to the apex, but four or five millimeter to the top of the tooth. And then what you would do is you would activate and go down and then you remove that and then condense that gutta percha down and you backfill with your gutta percha cone and that's what you get. That's doing uh, vertical condensation, or rather warm hydraulic condensation, because you're only going from five millimeter into the canal coronally, rather than five millimeter to the apex. But it took five minutes and a half, now, as opposed to just a conventional passive hydraulic condensation, in which what you're doing is you fit your cone, and then you place your sealer, push it to the apex, and then add a little bit of sealer and put your cone in, and you can see now you're done much faster, it only took one minute and 54 seconds, and you achieved in cold hydraulic condensation the same exact shape. Uh, I would actually argue that the coronal seal from that cold version is in fact better because you have a bioceramic sealing it rather than gutta percha that will shrink off. Uh, and the time difference in savings is quite a bit. And when it talks about comparing this to thermoplastic carrier techniques, now the savings are tremendous because you're just using a gutta percha cone that's, a, you know, at least in the U.S., I don't know what the prices are over there, it's, you know, 50 cents to a dollar, and then the sealer per application ends up being just three or four bucks, whereas in the U.S., the thermoplastic carriers, such as thermophil and gutta core, are 10 to 12 dollars each, so if you're doing a four canal molar, you're all of a sudden spending $50 just on carriers, not even counting the sealer. So it's a, it's a simpler, easier, and you can see radiographically, it still looks the same, whether you're using cold hydraulic condensation or just hydraulic condensation compared to the warm version. All right, so let's quickly talk about uh, just vital pulp therapy because that's a recent um, trend, and I think it's important. So I would like to kind of just quickly show you um, how this can be used for you clinically. So let's quickly talk about, the, let's draw a quick molar here for you and see how this techniques could be used 
in a vital pulp therapy method. And what, what basically is happening, let's say that you have a large decay and now the key with these things becomes diagnosis. Diagnosis is a key part of your success in these cases. You need to make sure you don't have necrotic cases, but if you do have pulpitis, previously we used to call it irreversible pulpitis, now the term pulpitis is now more of a spectrum because we now know that you're gonna have inflamed pulp, or you're gonna have maybe possibly infected pulp, then you're gonna have inflamed pulp, and then you have normal pulp. Previously we used to think that the whole pulp is going to get inflamed at the same time. But we now know that much like caries, which has caries, you know, in, infected dentin and then affected dentin and then normal dentin, you're gonna end up having, you know, necrotic pulp, you're gonna have then um, infected pulp, you're gonna have inflamed pulp, and then you have normal pulp. So the goal of vital pulp therapy in today's world has become one of, um, essentially create, removing all of the decay and all of the area where you have the um, inflamed pulp. So infected pulp and, and inflamed pulp, all the way to normal pulp has to be removed. And the way that happens is by removing all the decay and not being worried as much if you do get into the pulp. The more important thing is to make sure that you have removed all of the um, infected pulp and you can go ahead and place something like a um, you know sodium hypochlorite type of a uh, cotton pellet here that would be something like a two to five percent sodium hypochlorite you keep it for two minutes the key is that you have to make sure that you have stopped the bleeding so if the bleeding stops now you have a little coagulum here. You go ahead and you place your bioceramic right against it. And that you want it to be a pure bioceramic, in which case I'm talking about using the BC bioceramic endosequence BC putty or even a little thin layer of even the BC uh, RRM or even the sealer to be honest would work. Um, or you could obviously use biodentine or MTA. MTA would cause staining. And then what you want to do is you want to put something on top of this. And that would be, in, in the case of the U.S., you'd be using the, so you use your BC putty, followed by BC liner. Wherever you are, if you don't have access to BC liner, then you can use a glass ionomer um, on top of it. And that's what you would be doing. And you could basically fill the rest of this up with a glass ionomer. And that's, you wait eight weeks to see how things are going. And if everything is in good shape and the patient did well, then what you would be doing is you would be drilling into the um, um, ionomer material, or in this case, BC uh, liner, and then use the rest of it as base before you can go ahead and now um, place your final restoration. And that's what you do. And that's how you have, so you have, and the reason for that is because you wanna have the most biocompatible material here against the cells here. And then because the bio most biocompatible material being a bioceramic takes time for it to set and nobody's got time to wait, you can put this glass ionomer or the BC liner immediately on top of it in this what we call I call lid technique because you're using one product for the best biocompatibility and then you're litting it with a protective material that then allows you to um, um, to go on to either place your final restoration if you want or, or fill it up in bulk with a uh, with the material and come back later when you have for sure that everything is working to place your final material. So you have a couple of choices there. Now, this area where the um, uh, material where the good pulp starts could end up going deeper and deeper and deeper until I think at some point we might see if we have enough studies to support it that is reliable that maybe perhaps what we could start to do is more adult pulpotomies using these bioceramic uh, products 
so that you end up having essentially a uh, situation like this where you end up filling this up but well, now this is the putty and the rest of this is the liner and then you place your filling so it seems you know what they say is as things get <laughs> Uh, all these things come back in fashion. Uh, when we used to do pulpotomies before, we were using very caustic formaldehyde-based materials in the past, which were really bad. But now, as the new technology and these materials have become available, perhaps uh, what we need to do is we need to be going back to some of those techniques in these selected cases. And it's all about diagnosis as to which cases you should do. All right, so let's talk quickly about perforation repair. I'm getting, actually, I'm, I'm kind of running behind. Sorry about that. So let me quickly get into it. Uh, essentially, with perforation repair, it's the same kind of a lid technique. These are all varied. The lid technique is a technique that I've described as a combination, as I mentioned to you, of a biocompatible material and a restorative material on top of it. Instead of mixing the resin into the bioceramic, I think you need to have the best of two materials interfacing so that the best material for cells will be interfaced with the cell. So in this case, when you have a perforation, the same way as if you have a pulpal perforation, uh, you want a, bio a pure bioceramic against those PDL cells. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna see that's where you see your PDL, you control the bleeding, you take your putty material, put it on a uh, plugger. You can put a little bit of BC sealer if you want at the tip of the plugger so that it becomes a little bit easier to carry it and then you place that in there and gently pat it. You're not condensing it. It's all about just patting it down. And now what you have done is you've created a little plug of pure bioceramic that's interfacing the cells for the most biocompatibility. And you can remove the flash here. And then you can come back in here in the US where we have the BC liner. I would be adding a layer of BC liner on top of this to protect it so that then I can go ahead. So here you can see the plug and I'm gonna uh, be putting the BC liner on top of it. Now, for you, you could wanna put some glass ionomer. Uh, it's, BC liner has been optimized to work with the bioceramics, but glass ionomer is gonna be okay too. And also BC liner can be light cured. So you put that in there and now it's hard. And now I've done my little non-surgical lid technique where I have the putty against the cells and I am protecting it with a barrier of the liner and I can proceed to go ahead and do my access preparation on my root canal and then uh, instead of having to place the bioceramic and put a wet cotton on top of it like MTA and then have to come back on a second visit to finish the root canal and this is what happens and in the same visit I can proceed to do the root canal. So you see cases like this with a big post perforation. This was sent um, to me by one of our faculty at uh, uh, Real Dendos, Dr. Art Lane practices down in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, this, he managed this post that somebody had perfed and sent to him to see if they could save the tooth. He removed the post through the crown and went on and filled the hole after disinfection, the, the space with just putty, pure putty here. He didn't use a matrix barrier, so he ended up getting a little overfill of the putty, but just shows that it heals even though there was an overfill. And he's been following this case now for six or seven years and the tooth is still there. So that shows how a very biocompatible material can help save the tooth once you, and once you get rid of that biofilm that's been present. Last but not least, I quickly want to mention the surgical root end fillings. And uh, this is again the surgical lid technique which I've developed with the concept that in dental school we learned uh, back in the ancient times we used light body impression material and heavy body impression materials as opposed to now where everything is digital impressions. Uh, the idea was you use a light body material. In this case, I'm using the BC sealer or the syringable material to inject inside my retro preparation and then put a protective layer of the putty fast set on top of it so that it could actually create a, uh, a seal. And the reason for the putty fast set to protect it is because the sealer takes four hours to set and if in the retrofilling the blood can come in and contaminate it too quickly. But the putty fast set has a very nice uh, protective barrier on top and with the new minimal waste surgical tips that have uh, developed and are now um, being used it's very easy to inject them inside the tooth and I'm going to show you this case of a Harvard law student whom I saw to deal with the cervical perforation that his dentist had done during his root canal and now it was causing problems so I basically raised the flap and you can see that area on the side of the tooth that's the perforation I cleaned it out 
I disinfected it and then pushed the gutta percha in, optimized iodine to disinfect, injected the sealer, and then placed the facet putty. That's the lid technique and clean out the flash. And this is what we had. So that's how it looked at the end. And then put the suture, put the gum back together and it healed beautifully. Six months later, you can see the gum is doing well. But unfortunately, the root canal that the guy had done is now failing as well. So it's unfortunate that I, I wish I had done it at the same time, but at that time it didn't have a lesion. So I, went, I had to go back in now. This time I raised the submarginal flap so I wouldn't uh, disturb the area of the perforation and did the same lid technique at the apex too. And finally, this is the way it looks. So um, I have done a bunch of these and I have one of my residents at the school came to the office and pulled a bunch of the cases that I had done. Of these 11, uh, over 11,000 cases that I have done, we followed up a five-year follow-up to see what kind of success rate we had on these and we actually retention rate we had because we were just kind of calling in by the phone five years later to see how many of them still had the tooth and 97% of them did. There's also other studies were done radiographically out of Baylor University in Texas, where also they had over 90% success rate with radiographic follow-up of these necrotic cases. Essentially, in conclusion, what we have, these bioceramics and bioactive materials have really changed and will continue to change, uh, positively impact clinical endodontics. And while these bioceramics have excellent clinical properties, clinicians must be diligent to do their research and find out that using proven products and uh, that are backed by research are very important because uh, keep in mind a product such as Resolon came out and had a lot of bunch of in, in vitro uh, tests that were looking very good. But uh, as you know, Resolon is not pulled off the market because it was a huge disaster and in all cases all ended up failing six years later. Uh, I've tend to see that most cases in endodontics tend to fail around six to eight years. Uh, when there is a failure of, of uh, sorts, every time I see a case that I have to do on Apicon that's been referred to me or something like that, and then I, I ask when the endo was done, and they always say like six to eight years ago. So it's important, and that's why some of these ones that have now over 13 years of a um, track record is very important compared to taking a risk on something new. All right. Folks, I was going to take some live questions, but uh, unfortunately, I went over the time. I apologize about that. I would highly recommend that you, uh, if you have any questions, send them to me at my email address. That's anasa at hsdm.harvard.edu. And I would be more than happy to answer them for you. I probably should maybe take one or two of the questions anyway, even though I'm a little bit over time. But uh, let's see. Uh, so there's a bunch of questions here um, uh, about what is their post-op pain if the sealer is extruded. I think we kind of talked about that a little bit. Uh, again, it's the mechanisms that lead to extrusion that are the problem. If you just squirt the sealer out without having pushed any of the uh, biofilm and hypochlorite and your instrument out to cause mechanical, chemical, and biological trauma to the periapex, the sealer being out will not cause any problems. Now, of course, when people say, well, what if I get like a whole bunch of the stuff in the infiavular nerve canal? Well, obviously, if you get any sealer in the infiavular nerve canal, that's not good. Of course, if you were to compare which sealer would you rather have in there, you clearly would want to have a bioceramic, but you don't want to have it there at all uh, because you get mechanical compression too, even if you don't get chemical compression, you'll have problems with that. That's part of the reason why if you don't feel comfortable, I would not recommend that you inject directly into the tooth. I would certainly recommend that you, um, if you're going to inject, you inject only coronally. You always inject a little bit out so you know that you have the sealer right at the tip of the syringe before you put the syringe in the canal where it disappears and you inject a little bit and you quickly pull out the sealer and then you push it down. If you don't see things, if you don't have a microscope, I would highly recommend that you just use one of these um, paper pads as you can see here, let me quickly actually go into this. So like a paper pad like this is what you want to do. And you're just going to inject a little bit of the seal around the paper pad and uh, just butter up your file and you can put it in reverse and put it in the canal and then butter up your cone and you can put that in there. You're going to have to have enough sealer in there so you can fill up all the gaps. If you just butter up your cone and put it in there, oftentimes you will end up having uh, not enough sealer in there. Uh, another question is, what about Theracal? Uh, Theracal is a product that is a bioceramic mixed with a resin. The problem with mixing a resin with a bioceramic 
is that you don't get the best of both worlds. You get the average of each world. And in this case, the resin will actually prevent the bioceramic activity that you get from a pure bioceramic. That's part of the reason instead of wanting to add a resin to the BC sealer, I wanted to come up with a technique that allowed you to have the best of each world, which is a pure bioceramic against the cells. It requires one little extra step of having to put on a layer of, a, of this uh, optimized either glass ionomer or BC liner on top of that uh, by ceramic, but this extra step will actually help improve your success rate by not adding resin into your cement. Remember, every time you add resin, you have HEMA in there, and all of these products are, uh, are cytotoxic and they cause problems, so you want to avoid them. BC sealer retreatable, we talked about that. Of course, if you just fill the whole canal with BC sealer, it would be difficult to retreat because it's a cement based obturation. I don't know if if you've seen any of these uh, uh, root canals that were done in the old Soviet Union with zinc phosphate cement, I, we had a large po Russian population in, the, in Boston that come from Soviets back in 92 when uh, the, the lines opened. And we, I did, I, through the 90s, I saw a lot of these patients had to go through retreatment. And the ones that were done with zinc phosphate cement were just impossible to retreat. So we always went to surgery with those. And so uh, that's part of the reason why I was impacted and I realized the importance of developing a technique that is responsible to allow patients to have revision, which is what hydraulic condensation is all about. By having that gutta percha bulk in the middle of the canal, what you're doing is you're giving your, your, the next person who's gonna need to possibly retreat the tooth a chance to still maintain the tooth by dissolving the gutta percha in the middle by using chloroform or other solvents and then using some type of a 3D instrument to remove any seal around the canal walls going one size larger or so, and that cleans the walls, and then you refill it again. I've done retreatments of some of my own cases as well. Remember, no one's perfect. I have, uh, thankfully, I haven't had to do too many of those. It's small, the success rate has been very high, but if the ones that I've had to redo, I haven't had any problem at all going back and redoing it. The key is to make sure you have a good cone fit that goes all the way to the full working length, and then when you put the sealer, your sealer is vented back up around the cone so that you're seeding your cone all the way to the full working length. That's the technique for hydraulic condensation that should be done. All right, folks, I, uh, let me put back my uh, um, email back up here again. Thank you all so much for your attention. I apologize, I went over the time and I uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you at, at a meeting somewhere around the, uh, the globe and uh, maybe in your neck of the woods, maybe you guys come here to the US and I will see you, I'd love to. If, you, if I do see you, say, come stop by and say hi. I always love to talk to people that uh, from around the world that I've had a chance to kind of meet, I guess, virtually or remotely. All right, guys, take it easy. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the summer and uh, hopefully we'll get to meet one day. Have a good one. Oh, but we both know I'm Ali Nisei. Until next time, let's save some tea.